So we're back, it's Friday Forum Live. After a bit of a break, we are once again broadcasting live and direct from Point Blank here in East London for our weekly live session. Uh, today we are also joined by uh, head DJ tutor Ben Bristow, who's gonna be taking us through some creative DJ and scratch techniques. So yeah, as I said, uh, Ben is here to take us through uh, to kind of the use of, of hot cues and some other kind of uh, creative scratch techniques. Um, also, Friday Forum is of course your chance to get involved and ask any questions you've got. So make sure you get involved via the chat room on YouTube and I will be fielding your questions for Ben a little bit later on in the session. Uh, just before we get into it, um, I'm going to give you a quick rundown of what's been going on this week at Point Blank. Um, so first up, we've just uploaded a, a brand new series of tutorials to YouTube where Paul Crossman is giving you a real insight into the brand new Machine 2. Uh, just head over to the YouTube channel and make sure you subscribe to get all the latest videos in your inbox. Also, we've just added a international student profile onto Point Blank Plus. This one features uh, student James Hopkins, who's been releasing a whole range of different stuff on a load of different record labels. Well worth a look, so head over to Point Blank Plus for that. And finally, we also have the whole range of online courses starting on December 9th. Uh, if you head over to pointblankonline.net, you can check them out. And also, all of the courses here in London starting in January are filling up pretty quickly. So if you do want to come and study with us uh, as of January in the new year, make sure you get over to pointblanklondon.com and check out the full range. So yeah, that's enough from me. Uh, ben, take us through a little bit what you're going to be doing today. Uh, yeah, so I was just going to demonstrate a couple of uh, different techniques that you can use the hot cues for on the CDJ 2000 Nexus decks. Obviously hot cues you get on quite a lot of uh, different models of CDJs, like the 1000s, uh, the 2000s before the Nexus decks came out. Um, for those of you who don't know, you know, hot cues are kind of just cue points you can trigger in real time. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's various different ways you can use them in the mix, uh, you know, to emulate kind of scratching techniques. So I'm going to try and kind of show you the way to do them with hot cues and then maybe show the, the scratching way of doing it. Right, uh, the original sort of, way sort of you would do it. the more manual yeah, way yeah. before these uh, came into existence, really. Oh. I mean, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, so that's the, the overview, really. And also uh, the flare scratch, I was going to take you through uh, one okay. of the more sort of advanced scratch techniques. Cool. Yeah. All right, well, yeah, we'll, we'll get into it. And if uh, any questions come through on the chat room, I'll, I'll kind of them over. Cool. All right. Okay, cool. Nice one, so for those of you who don't know, hot cues are uh, basically three cue points on a CD deck. Uh, you can have three cue points per track. You can save loops to the cue buttons. Um, and you can also now with record box pre-program those. Uh, so you can kind of load them in, you know, you can program them before the set and then load them up as and when you want them. Um, so just to just for the basics of how to set them really, it's all about pressing record mode. So when you press record mode, the buttons will go red, which means they're ready to be programmed. So you can either set them in real time while the track plays, or you can hold the tune and set it more like a kind of traditional cue point. So if I play this track, I'll just skip it forward a bit. If I just literally, I'm in record mode, so when I press the button, you'll see it flashes, and that means it's ready to be triggered. So in order to trigger a hot cue, once you've programmed it, you just press record mode again, and it goes green. So that means you can re-trigger the cue point, basically. Um, now, previous to the CDJ2000 Nexus decks, it would mean that when you trigger that point, it will jump to that point in the track and play from that point. Whereas now, they've introduced the slip mode, so you can use them in kind of more creative ways by uh, triggering points of the track, and then it will return to where you were before you triggered it. So it's kind of a, it gives a lot more opportunities for creative stuff with slip mode on. Um, so just on these as well, if I wanted to save those, because I'm using a USB stick, literally just press memory, and that will render the cue point to the actual file on your USB key. So it means you can load them up, um, you know, at a future date, basically. So if I want to load up a hot cue that's already been saved, uh, and it's not kind of currently loaded in there, all you have to do is hold down the record call button, and any that are available will flash. So you can load in, you know, for, for any track that you've previously saved cue points, you can load them up. If you're using record box for all you uh, record boxers out there, um, you can have a setting where it automatically loads in hot cues for you. So that's just like auto load hot cues on track load. Uh, and that would mean when you load up a track, it will actually load in all the hot cues related to that track. 
Um, anyone who's used to using the earlier models of decks are probably more used to doing it kind of on the fly where you know you just set them and then use them for triggering at the time. Um, so one useful technique that I use hot cues for is uh, to kind of create an echo effect uh, when I'm trying to remove a track from the mix because um, obviously this allows you to re-trigger a part of the track repeatedly uh, and if you combine that with the volume fader then you can basically make it sound a bit like the tune is echoing out, which is useful if you're trying to get rid of a track because the new track's about to drop or you know you might not have done that mix before and you, you quickly need to remove that track. Um, one thing on this, you better check that your volume fader curve adjustment is set smooth because certain mixers, you can change how quickly the sound fades with your volume faders. On this DJM 900 Nexus, we've, we've got three different options here. So obviously if it's fading really quickly at the top of the fader, it, it's a bit harder to do this technique. So I would always you know, set that to the smooth fade, so it means it's going to be a gradual reduction in volume. Um, so literally, if I'm playing this track, if I repeatedly hit the hot cue, whilst fading the volume down, you can hear it sounds pretty much like echo. Mm. Um, one thing as well, if you have used Rekordbox and you've put you know, a grid around your track in order to uh, you know, have the BPM readout more accurate and stuff, you've got to watch out for this quantize button because if that's activated, what it doesn't allow you to do is trigger the hot cues really sort of quickly because it kind of snaps to the grid markers. Um, so you know, I'm used to kind of doing like quick kind of triggering. If I had the quantize on and this had been through Rekordbox, it wouldn't let me do that. It would just snap to the nearest beat grid marker. So it can restrict your kind of um, you know, triggering if you're trying to do it really fast. Obviously, it's great to quantize tunes and kind of have the grid there so that, it, you know, especially if you're a uh, Paris Hilton and want to use the master <laughs> and the sync button, uh, you know, that's always useful. Uh, it's just if I'm about to do something like this where I'm doing it quickly, I will take quantize off. Uh, if you're on an earlier version of the um, 2000, that button isn't there, so you'd have to go into the menu and check whether quantize is on or not in the menu. Whereas uh, on the newer ones, on the Nexus decks, they've added the, the quantize button, so it's pretty easy just to turn it off. Um, so just to show you that in the mix, let's say I'm playing this track, I'll bring a new track in, and I'm going to use that hotkey to kind of get rid of this track. Maybe take a bit of the bass out just to give it a just in case I hit it a slightly out of time. So I'm removing a bit of the base of this one and then literally just... So you know, it's quite a quick way of getting tunes out of the mix. Obviously you've got to be a bit careful if it's beats that you're triggering and there's kind of hi-hats and stuff after the beat you're triggering, you've got to be pretty accurate with your timing because mm. it can go a bit clangy. Um, you know, sometimes I might do it on a scratch sample as well, so then it's just literally re-triggering the sample with the, the, the volume coming down. Um, it's just kind of a useful way to use them, really. Uh, now, if you are of a sort of old-school disposition and you don't like, you know, using a button when you could use two hands and make it look a bit cooler, uh, <laughs> there is a, ch a technique where it's known as echoes. So what that involves is kind of replaying uh, the beat but every time you play it, you kind of basically you're manually releasing the sound, but you're using the volume so that each time you release it, the volume is at a lower level. So if I say I've got this beat here, if I play it, I'm basically going to play it forwards with the volume fader fully up, then shut the volume fader and rewind the sound that I just played back to the start point. Now the next time I release it, the volume's going to come up, but not all the way mm -hmm. to the top. So it's kind of I'll show you it in sort of quickly. So it's like this. So you're basically, you know, you're pulling the fader down in order to remove, uh, pull the sound back to the beginning. And then each time you play the sound forward, the volume's lower. So you get that kind of echo effect. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, you know, a lot of hip hop DJs use that, but it's very applicable to all sort of genres, really. Mm -hmm. It's just, you've got to be accurate because if you kind of catch it and do it out of time with the tune that was playing, it's not going to sound like a proper echo. Um, so let's say I'll, when I get to this beat here, what I tend to do is kind of uh, make almost like a little tripod out of my fingers and thumb just so that I'm resting. I've got a nice solid kind of resting point on the mixer. Then I, I just use my, sorry, not my thumb, my, my three fingers here 
then it means you get more of a sturdy kind of uh, you know grip on it um it's one of those you know if i was using a scratching sample you can do the same thing um, we're gonna do a song, 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 song. it basically is echo because yeah, echo yeah. is just repeating the same sound and it gets lower in volume uh but it's one you know all these sorts of techniques even if there is an easy way of doing it it's a good thing to try and practice because it's all kind of coordination mm. you know if, if you're anything like me i'm faced with mixers sometimes where there is no effects units and decks where there are no hot cues. Yeah. So if you if you are only relying on the echo on the mixer and the hot cues, and you're faced with a you know really old mixer, there's not much you can do really. Whereas with this, all you need is a volume fader, which, you know, and a deck. Um, so it's worth practicing if you if you're going to try and get good at it. You're literally playing the sound forward, bringing the fader down, then bringing it up less, and again. You can even do it the other way, so you kind of e increase the volume each time. Yeah. That you never heard. Yeah, so that's the, the first technique. Uh, the other thing I use hot cues for is kind of uh, drumming with them. So, you know, this like this new term's come around recently, finger drumming. You know, there's people like Jeremy Ellis doing loads of these. Kind of MPC stuff. Yeah, and uh, Arab Music as well, yeah, yeah. doing crazy, like, finger drumming. So, you know, this is quite a powerful machine, the CDJs. So you can actually use these like a kind of, like, drum pads, if you think about mm. it. Um, what's annoying is they don't have, like, a one-shot mode where you can just press it like a cue point. We got where it only plays when you hold it. When you it. take your finger off, yeah, it yeah. stops. Because yeah. with cue points, it will play the next bit of the track unless you're triggering them really fast. It's right. always going to start hitting the next bit. Um, so what I've done in the past is where I get like a... Better to get like a, a dry kick and snare sound where there's not sort of a bass line and, you know, vocals underneath it. You want it so that it's like isolated drum sounds. So this is kind of... I've got a kick and a snare, one after the other, right? So if I set press record mode, set one as the kick drum, and then the next one as the snare drum, press record mode again, so now I can trigger those. Obviously, if I'm triggering these faster than the original speed of this track, it's fine, because it won't start hitting the yeah. bit after it. So you can kind of... You know, uh, but you can hear there, it's starting to hit other bits of the snare drum, like after the kick when you trigger it. So what I worked out, was if you want it to kind of act a bit like a one-shot trigger, the Q button or the pause button will stop the sound as soon as you've triggered it. So you can kind of, you can right. press the, the Q button, then, sorry, the hot Q, then the Q button. So it stops, so it's more like a one-shot mode. So if you do that with the kind of, both of them. So it's kind of, snapping it back to silence, basically. So you can isolate sounds like that. Um, you know, you might just do that as a little thing over an acapella mm. or in time with a, with a beat. Again, it's all good for practicing timing. If you can drum in time, you're going to be very good at cueing. And, you know, DJs like EZ are all yeah. about the cue buttons. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. I saw him recently at BPM and he did it where he had a kick drum on one cue button, the snare on the other, and he was actually put a bit of reverb over him was playing a, yeah. a drum beat just with the cue buttons. I think I've seen him do that in the boiler room. Actually. Yeah. It's pretty amazing. Yeah. People love that sort of stuff. You know, yeah, if, yeah, if they yeah. just do that in the middle of a set, it's more creative and kind yeah. of a bit more interesting. Um, so it's literally getting used to doing like kind of, you know, think about you've got A as your kick drum, B as your snare drum. So you're kind of going A, then the cue button, then B, then the cue button. Obviously, if you're doing quick, like double kick drums, you don't need to press Q in, in between those because you, you can just yeah, double yeah. tap it. Uh, another thing you could do to kind of make that sound a bit more interesting, uh, if you put an echo over that, but you make it a really short echo, so, you know, it almost sounds like a reverb, but you get this kind of cool, especially on this 900, you get this kind of metallic sort of effect. Um, so if I put, basically I'm assigning echo to channel one, uh, and what I want to do is make it really short, and you'll hear it kind of... You know, you get this kind of crazy metallic sort of effect over the beat. So if you do it with that on... Yeah, you get, you know, it's just another thing you can add to it, really. Or you could try adding reverb over that. Um, 
yeah, the other thing that I've done in the past with, with that sort of similar thing, just to get out of the kind of having to press Q all the time, you know, on CDJs, you've got a massive wide pitch range. So if you put, if you leave master tempo on, but you put it on wide and put it kind of at minus 50 odd, then you get the same sort of effect anyway. Yeah. You know, it might sound good over like a dubstep sort yeah, of yeah, an yeah. instrumental section or whatever. Um, that as well I've used before, you know, it was a really good sort of effect to, uh, to get rid of a track. If you're, if you're playing a track and you have master tempo on and it's on wide, you know, you can achieve a similar thing with the brake speed, but I'm sure you've heard this maybe at the end of a night. To get rid of the last track or to get into the next DJ set, you kind of literally... Because it kind of creates this That mad... jungle stretch. Yeah, 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 it's basically really time stretching it. Uh, what you've got to be careful of is if you go to minus 100, it's all over because it <laughs> completely stops. You, can, you know, you can get it down to minus 99.5 and then you're getting this kind of crazy like, yeah. effect. Um, the, another good thing to add to that is like the filter. So on, on, the, uh, on the 900, you've got these uh, color effects across the mixer channels. So each, mix, uh, each channel can have, you know, one of these filters applied or whatever the effect is. So with the filter, it's kind of a high pass filter if you go to the right. Whereas if you go to the left, it's a low pass filter. So that, you know, I might be doing a transition where I can't mix the two tunes or I'm changing genres in the middle of a set and mm. I just want to, you know, I don't want to mix them together. So I would maybe do this where I put it on, keep my tempo on, put the pitch to wide and then literally slow it down, have my new tune queued up ready so I can trigger it straight away. It works really well if you've got vocals in the tune as well, so you hear them yeah, really yeah, like yeah. elongate. And then when it gets down to this stretchy bit, you can kind of... And then just filter it out, kind of thing. Um, you know, as with all these sorts of techniques, don't overdo them. You yeah. don't want to do that every single transition yeah, yeah, yeah. you do, because people are going to come up to you and go, look, this is now getting ridiculous. <laughs> I've heard the same trick 15 times. Uh, but, there, you know, it's just sometimes you are faced with mixers without effects, or, you know, you might not have a brake speed, for example, like on the on the little CDJ 400s, they, you know, they're USB compatible, but they don't have a brake speed on them. So mm -hmm. that is a way of kind of emulating that, that technique really. Um, yeah, so the, the kind of the, the harder way of doing the drumming thing that I was just doing with the hot cues is obviously where you're physically manipulating a kick and a snare drum in order to trigger them in, a, you know, in a certain order to make it sound like a drum beat. You know, beat juggling, mm -hmm. I'm sure if you've heard of it, it's, you know, like really, part of turntablism where you're manipulating individual beats and creating new kind of compositions. So drumming is part of that. Um, or when you get, you know, teams of DJs, you might have one who's the drummer, someone else is doing a little scratch solo mm. over it or whatever. Um, so with, if I've got a, a, what I need really for this particular technique is a, a kick and a snare very close together. So like a, almost like a quarter of a beat apart, because then you've got the kick followed immediately by the snare drum. If they're more than a, like a beat apart, then it's quite hard to trigger them in the right order because there's too big a gap between the two. So if I go to this one. So here I've got the kick and the snare. So this was actually the first scratch technique I ever learned. This is what made me want to learn all the others because one of my friends had a, a deck with just a, a kick and a snare on it like this. So the, the really, the basics of it is kind of you're triggering the kick drum then you're going through and kick triggering the kick and the snare drum. So, so it's like really just a short kind of forward and backward movement followed by a slightly longer yeah. one. And when you put that together, you've got the snare falling on the second and fourth beat of the bar. So you get that kind of. And that's without the crossfader. So if you want to make it sound, you know, even less like scratching, you, you, you want to try and remove those rewind sections so you're not hearing any of the pullbacks. So that really, you're doing kind of a series of uh, forward cut scratches. So what I'm doing here is I've got my thumb on the crossfader. As I l let go of the sound, I open the fader so I get just the kick drum. Mm -hmm. Then there's two ways of doing this. You can do it where you keep hold of the platter so you're kind of just doing the forward on the kick drum 
then you're opening the fader and doing the kick and the snare. So it's literally just like open, go forward, shut the fader, pull back, then open again, go forward, shut the fader. So you get. So really, that doesn't sound like scratching if you, you know, it's just yeah, a kick yeah, and yeah. a snare, you know. Uh, if you let go of the platter, then you've got the added complication of catching it and pulling it back to the right bit, but then it will sound exactly like the original beats, you know, because you're not propelling it, you're just letting it play at normal tempo. So it's literally just kind of a, well, when you release the sound, it's more like the forward scratch or the forward cut. So you're only letting the audience hear the forward part. Whereas if you push it, it's more like a, a stab that's known as, because it's higher pitch. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So if, I mean, if you practice that, it's really just those two moves. You know, you can do like different patterns, obviously. It's just learning to trigger the kick and the snare separately. You know, you can do like a dubstep beat. House. It's a bit easy, that one. Uh, yeah. uh, or you can sort of then get a bit more complicated with it and like actually transform certain parts of the bits where you're pulling it back. So say like I play the kick and the snare as I did before, but then to get myself back to the beginning, I'm going to tap this twice so I get so you hear the little pull back, so then it sounds like this. Again, as well, another thing you could add to that is a little bit of echo, because then you get the same sort of um, you know, reverby sort of effect if you make it really short. Um, what I would suggest on this is though, rather than assigning it to the channel, because then what's going to happen is, when you shut the fader, like if you've got a longer echo, it kind of... Uh, you get the bleed out or something. Well, it cuts out. Yeah. Because it's kind of pre-crossfader. Yeah. So what I would do is assign the effect to the crossfader, because that makes it post-fader. So if I go to crossfader A, then mm. when I shut the crossfader, this, this cuts yeah, yeah, out, but yeah. the echo doesn't kind of thing. I mean, because it's so short, it doesn't matter, but... Maybe a bit shorter, because you want yeah, so I mean, spend about 10,000 hours doing that in a dark room, uh, and you should... You like know, Ben you, did, yeah, of course. Yeah. No, I mean, my drumming isn't that great, to be honest, but... If uh, you know, if you look at Cuba and people like that, he can literally just use two sounds and create an hour-long set, yeah. and it's all you know. There's thousands of different patterns out there, but you know, these sorts of things. It's more of a performance. Mm. People do go for that when you know at gigs. It's it's better than the average person who just looks like they're checking their emails. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. Uh, it's sort of. Yeah. It definitely brings something else to the table. Mm. You know, like if if you're seeing someone like a traditional DJ in a club, and then someone comes on and does something, you know, a little bit yeah. special. You know, you're gonna take notice. People, yeah, people do like it. It's just that little bit different. Um, yeah, so the, I mean, the echoes thing can be linked to the drumming thing as well. So you might be doing the drumming normally, then you start. Yeah. That's uh, if I, one technique is to kind of uh, if you let the kick and snare play, then pull it back really quickly, so you get like that. But then also use the volume, so you get this. It might be the way you actually end that little routine. That yeah, you're doing, yeah, you know, yeah. So sometimes you could be there thinking, how am I actually going to get out of this? Uh, <laughs> I've been going on for too long. Um, yeah, so that, that's, it's all about, you know, just thinking about how you can use the mixer to its full potential, really. Mm. When I started, my mixer was so basic, I couldn't even use the crossfader because it was, you know, really smooth curve. Right. So I was like, right, well, I was using line switches, like anything, it had no effects on it. So it was all about like, what, how, what can I possibly do with this mixer? I do think it can get a bit easy these days to rely yeah. too much on effects and think, oh, I'll just do the easy route because I don't really have to practice that much. Mm. But then that means pretty much anyone can do it, you know? You, I'd rather have kind of... And as you say, it looks better. Well, yeah, you know, that's definitely. the thing. And you can't, I've seen, you know, I've seen people literally freak out when they get there and realise the mixer they're, they're using is not 
a DJM 2000, which yeah, they're yeah, so yeah. used to having all these effects. It, it kind of shows, you know, what you actually can do. You on, have to uh, be yeah. versatile, yeah, definitely. Yeah, that's it. Some of these techniques, you know, you might not, they might not be applicable. If I'm playing sort of funk and soul, I'm not going to start drumming over it necessarily because <laughs> it's kind of a bit out of place. But, you know, that sort of digital drumming thing, quite often you could use over like dubstep, as mm -hmm. I said, or you might just drop an acapella and then drum and then drop the actual tune that mm -hmm. you're, you've been using the beats from. Um, yeah, I mean, for those of you who really want to cheat and do want the easy option for that drumming technique, obviously if you've set a cue point on the start of the kick and snare, you can just go... <laughs> you know, drink at the same time, whatever. Yeah. Eating pizza. Yeah, 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 check your emails while you do it. <laughs> obviously, because the cue point snaps back every time, so you're literally just playing the kick on its own and then holding it a bit longer for this kick and the yeah. snare together, yeah? But obviously, one of the hardest things that I found when I was learning how to drum was you get you almost get into the habit of always pulling the sound back to the beginning. So if you want to be able to trigger the kick, then the snare, what you have to do is kind of stop in between the two. Rather than going and pulling it back, you have to go and then when you go forward the next time, you're on the snare drum. So it's, I see a lot of people where they, they're so used to pulling the, the sound back when the fade is shut that they, it's quite hard to do that. So it, it's known as a, well really it's a tear scratch. When you're going forward stopping and then going forward again, you, you're kind of pausing for a split second in between mm -hmm. the sound. So you get, then you can do it in two parts back as well. Because what it means then you can kind of do the kick and then stop and then do the snare. Yeah, um, I mean, some you know, if you've got a different configuration of beats from that, you might have the snare then the kick, so then it's like boom rather than mm -hmm. so that would lend itself to other patterns. You know, certain sounds or combinations of kicks and snares mean you can't do certain patterns because that's just not how it kind of works. Um, so yeah, I mean, just to practice. Yeah, when you're trying I've to got, get a, good got a quick question for you, to yep. you actually, Ben. Uh, Adam has asked um, if you've got any advice on or recommendations for a beginner, 17 year old guys looking to get into DJing, yep. what equipment recommendations would you have? Uh, I mean, there's so much choice nowadays. It, it used to be the answer to that question used to be two Technics 1210s yeah. and a mixer. Yeah. Now you've got, you know, 50 million controllers. Uh, I mean, would you still recommend starting with vinyl or not anymore? I, I think it's a good way to start because you, you, you learn the fundamentals. Yeah. You know, it's always good to know how it's come about. Mm -hmm. the CDJs make certain things very easy, whereas on vinyl it's not as easy. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's like if you learn on vinyl and you go to CD decks, you're going to find CD decks easy to use. Mm -hmm. If you've only ever used CD decks and you go to vinyl, you won't be able to mix on vinyl because yeah, it's a yeah. completely different feel to it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's, it's, it's very easy these days to just be guided by your eyes and look at the BPM counter and look at the waveform and then you're not mixing with your ears then. Mm -hmm. It's kind of better to learn what you're hearing, I yeah. think, because that's what the audience are doing. They're not looking at a screen. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but I mean, there's some good controllers out there, fairly, you know. Yeah, it, someone's it, actually mentioned the DG, DDJ Ergo. Yeah, the Ergo, that's, a, that's one of the lower end uh, controllers. I've used that before. Mm -hmm. I think I've actually done a video on that. Yeah, so, I think yeah. there is one on YouTube. Yeah. Um, I mean, it, I would personally recommend the SX, the DDJ SX okay. controller. It's a bit more expensive. Yep. But they've, they've just recently bought out a two channel version of that. I think it's just called the SR. Okay. Uh, I mean, that's got like eight hot cue buttons on it. Mm -hmm. It's Pioneer, so it's pretty, you know, it's well built. Yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. Um, it's, the, the Ergo is good, but it's, it's kind of more one of the lower end. Mm. Um, yeah, controllers. Maybe we'll, we'll put a link up for the, the SX, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah I mean, we'll the, there's that. also the, you know, the DDJ S1 and the T1, which are the four channel Tractor or Serato Pioneer okay. controllers, which are quite good. And do you recommend the software route? You know, is that something? Uh, I mean, I use Serato Scratch Live personally. Yeah. Um, Serato DJ is now the new Serato software that's basically becoming, it's going to sort of, um, Serato Scratch Live is going to stop existing. I right, think in yeah, February, yeah. All the, even the hardware boxes are going to migrate over to Serato DJ software. Okay. So a lot of the controllers will work with with that, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the SX is Serato DJ compatible. Okay. Um, I mean, I've spent so many years carrying massive bags of records <laughs> to gigs. I was like, you know, I'd rather have a hard drive this big with all my music on yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. I, I think, yeah, these days, it, if I was starting out now, I probably wouldn't 
start buying you know the amount of records that I've bought over mm-hmm. the years but just because th- there's no need really yeah yeah there's always going to be purists who are like you know mine is the only proper DJ yeah. but I, I mean ultimately it's, does the music sound good are the people dancing mm-hmm. that's what you've got to think about really yeah and I guess for, for, for someone really starting out there's a certain element of um, you know user friendly you know and or sort of you know and it's sort of easy to get used to straight away, really. Yeah. And some, something like those controllers is probably a good option. Yeah. I mean, a lot of the controllers are very similar to the layout of a CDJ anyway. Mm. So if you get used to how that works, yeah. and then you have to mix in a club where they've got CD decks, it's got a cue button, it's got a play button, you know, it's still the same thing. Yeah, yeah. It's just maybe slightly different layout. Cool. Yeah. Um, have we got any more? Um, we've got another question. Someone has asked, could you do some... Um, <laughs> Someone's asked if you can do any scratch tutorials with some famous scratch samples. Yeah, we've definitely got some. Yeah, there, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Well, the you most can give famous. Give us a quick demo. The, I can do. Yeah, the most famous is the R sound, that's, which that's is that's one yeah. that's been mentioned here. Yeah. yeah, so that is kind of it's actually from a tune called uh, "Change the Beat" by Fab Five Freddy, who's famous for being in the Blondie tune uh, "Rapture." Oh, that's right. Rap, yeah, yeah. It was the first ever. So he's like a graffiti yeah, yeah. artist from New York, but he's also a DJ. And it's, I've got it on vinyl, that tune, just because I had to have it. Isn't that the first time that rap was, was on like a video or something like Possibly, that? Possibly, yeah. yeah. But basically, that is him on a vocoder synth going, ah, this stuff is really fresh. Like, <laughs> and it's separate from the tune. It's right at the very end. Right. So obviously, it was, came out in like 83 or 4. So we, people just took that. that yeah, so that, that, basically, there's this, you know, Cuba, I've heard him interviewed, and he says, you can tell how good someone is by what they can do with that sound in the same way as if you give a guitarist an acoustic guitar, right. you can tell how good they are with that. So we're about to see how good you are. Well, yeah, yeah, I should have said that. <laughs> uh, yeah. So that's, that's the sound we're talking about. The reason it's so good is because it's got a sharp attack. It starts loud and it's quite long. So it means you can chop it into loads of different right. pieces. Because right, right. it starts loud, you can do stuff like the chirp where you're kind of creating this sharp sort of effect. Well, I'll give you a little demo. With yeah, the, with let's the hear a little bit yeah. of a demo, Ben. Yeah, yeah. Let's just get a John beat on. And is it the case, do you like hunt for new scratch samples? Always, yeah. I mean, yeah. It, uh, there are, like, you can overdo it with the same sound. I'm guilty of that myself because yeah. I'm so used to using it. But it's yeah. always good to have stuff that people haven't necessarily heard thousands of times. Mm. Uh, you know, there's loads of free ones available online. People create their own, you know, and upload them to SoundCloud or whatever. Mm. Uh, sometimes, you know, f- film samples or yeah, things like yeah, that yeah. are good. Um, Something that's slightly recognisable, I guess, is, is kind yeah. of good. Because yeah. a lot of the time people don't understand what you're doing, really. Mm. If they're not a DJ, they're not going to know really what scratching is anyway. Yeah, so yeah. if they hear a sound that they know and you're manipulating it and you, yeah. they see you moving your hands, it almost breaks it down for people a bit. So they sort of yeah, get yeah, that definitely. you're the one doing it rather than playing a sample or whatever. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that, that R sound is the one to practice with, I would say. Yeah, that's um, the one to use. Yeah. Right? But I mean, w- when you're dealing with other samples, you might have ones where there's several syllables, for example then you can do stuff that you couldn't do with that sound. So right. Maybe you've got like one, two, three, four as a sample, then you can go book a one, took a two, took yeah, a three, yeah, took yeah. a four. You know, you can do other stuff that you couldn't do with that because it's just one long sound kind yeah. of thing. Um, yeah. Well, we are uh, kind of out of time, oh, right. Ben. Okay. Um, but tell us, uh, where can we catch you playing next? Uh, tomorrow night, I'm DJing at Cafe 1001 for Inside Out Records. So that's oh, that's, is that a student? Yeah, Some student Stavros, night. yeah. yeah, yeah it's his yeah. label. It's a, kind of uh, just a showcase for the label, basically. Okay. Yeah. So that's uh, seven till three in the morning. So, that's yeah. fun. Yeah. All right, well, um, yeah, thanks for coming down, Ben. That's all right. And uh, yeah, thanks to all you guys watching. Uh, make sure you do subscribe to the YouTube channel. Um, this session will be archived pretty much straight away and you can check out all the other content for free on our YouTube channel. If you hit subscribe as well, you will get it all directly to your inbox. Um, So that's it from us, uh, Friday Forum Live, and we'll be back next week. We'll see you then. Bye-bye.